for administrative detention for the rest of his life. It's a shocking decision. That's the common law. Now, one of the four in the majority, Justice McHugh, on his retirement said, had there been a Human Rights Act, I could have gone the other way. Had we had a protection of human rights, I could have made a different decision. That's the kind of thing that we need to achieve. And it's, it's, all, it's, it's great if you're on the winning side and if you're, if you're privileged, but for those who aren't, we have a system that is not working as well as it could be. And that's why I think the Charter is a great step forward and we need to make it national. Any other questions? Uh, Bill. Then, then back. Can you talk a bit louder? Um, Phil Lynch from the Human Rights Law Resource Centre. I have a question for both candidates. Uh, recently on, late line, uh, on state line, rather, uh, Josephine Cafania highlighted the issue of um, police-related deaths and the system that we have operating in Victoria, which is that police investigate police-related deaths. Uh, what would you, each of you do in that area to ensure more effective accountability and scrutiny? And relatedly, given that a lot of these issues have arisen from the police shooting of Tyler Cassidy, what would you do around uh, uh, regulation of police and equipping and empowering them to deal better with uh, people experiencing crisis, including mental illness? In relation to the, the, uh, the Tyler Cassidy case, that's obviously uh, subject to uh, further investigation. I think the coroner's... Uh, uh, court is looking at it. I've met with Mrs. Cassidy and she's made, made uh, uh, Tyler's mum and, and she's made some very uh, compelling points about the way that uh, investigation was handled and I think there are, uh, they are valid points. I can't take it further at the moment in terms of uh, an appropriate policy uh, response to it because there are a lot of issues to be uh, considered but clearly you want to find ways of making sure that where there is uh, a, a shooting uh, that that is thoroughly investigated and there's a, res uh, a response to it that uh, identifies what's happened and, and as far as possible make sure it doesn't happen uh, in future and clearly what happened there does raise a, a lot of issues. Uh, there's obviously uh, one would expect that there will be uh, a further range of facts put before the, uh, the coroner's court. So again, I don't want to preempt what the facts are that are, uh, may be put before the coroner's court. Uh, but uh, any police shooting raises very serious issues, and we need to find a way of, of having those issues properly investigated. Brian Walters, do we have the architecture right? No, we don't. Um, look, police have to deal with some pretty tough situations at times. And we, we ask them to do that on our behalf. And we give them firearms, you know, the power to exercise lethal force. And where we give that power, it must be accountable. We owe that to the police as well as to the community. Then we need to have police who are properly trained, um, and we need to have proper oversight procedures. Now in the last 50 years, sorry, in the last 25 years in Victoria, uh, we've had 50 citizens shot dead by police. That is more than in every other state of Australia put together. Now is that because we're worse here in Victoria? Or is there a problem with our training and culture in the police force? Now one of, the, one of the things that we need to have in place where there's been a fatal shooting by police is a system of investigation which is hierarchically independent of the police force. The police need that as much as the community so that we get an investigation that can't be said to be tainted, that isn't done by someone who has a future um, promotion to think about. In this Tyler Cassidy case we've had a 15 year old kid shot dead. That is an enormous, an enormous thing to have happened in our community. It makes us all feel 
that bit less safe. We owe it to the police involved, to the Cassidy family, and I'm really talking generally rather than specifically. In those sort of situations, we need an independent investigation. At the moment, there just isn't provision for that. There should be. That's part of what protecting life is, having a system to investigate the failure to protect it. Oh, sorry. Uh, up the back and then down the front. Um, I'm always amazed by how the argument by Conservatives tends to be that the Parliament should be supreme over ju the judiciary. And it fails to take into account that most citizens don't deal with the Parliament, they deal with the executive. That is, they deal with an individual police officer or an individual um, housing commission person or an individual you know, local council. And these people here, I believe, you know, should be subservient to the judiciary and they should be held accountable for their, their executive decisions. And what a charter does is protect the citizen from the executive, not the citizen from the parliament. And whether it's a charter or some sort of ombudsman system, which used to be the case back in the 70s where the ombudsman would review executive decisions that were wrong and make, in that case, an unbinding determination, which in most cases was accepted because a non-acceptance would cause a parliamentary report to be prepared saying that Department X did this wrongly and chose not to correct it, and that was regarded as a serious opprobrium. Why is it that we've allowed the argument to move from the overarching, overreaching, increasing power of the executive instead of... You know, so, so we have allowed the argument to be taken from that to some argument about democratic principles. As I would say, I'd much rather have a judge deciding my future than a bureaucrat. Robert Clark, a judge or a bureaucrat, what's your choice? <laughs> um, your point is right that the executive should be subject to legislation and the executive should be subject to the judiciary. The problem with the Charter is if it becomes directly binding that it sets it is a, a truncated set of high-level principles that are imposed upon the rest of the legislative regime and can operate in unintended ways. I, I agree with your point about the, the Ombudsman and about the desirability of uh, administrative and judicial remedies when the executive fails to uh, do what it's, it should do. My concern about the whole charter mechanism is that we are spending tens of millions of, of dollars trying to get the executive and the administration to do what it should be doing anyway. And there should be far more effective uh, and, and efficient ways of doing it uh, than establishing the, the charter regime. But your bottom line points I, I agree with in terms of the executive being subject to the, both the judiciary uh, uh, and the legislation, their legislative duties. Brian? During the uh, debate about the Charter and also about the Human Rights Act at a federal level, it was often said in criticism of these instruments that they gave power to unelected judges. They do nothing of the kind. They give power to unelected citizens. That's the point of this legislation. And they tell judges how to react to certain situations. They give the judges the criteria. Parliament gives power to the executive and it's one of the functions, I think, of that conferral of power by Parliament that, the, that it should also always ensure that the power conferred is accountable because unaccountable power will be abused. And the courts are one of the main ways of making the exercise of power accountable. So in a sense it's not as though any one of the three branches of government, Parliament, the judiciary or the executive is superior. It, all three have their own sphere and interaction. And where a bureaucrat is making a decision, for example on an issue of housing, um, ultimately if that power can't be reviewed by someone seeing whether it's been exercised lawfully and in accordance with human rights, then there's a gap in the rule of law. There's a gap in our democracy.